I like that you do these in person too. Yeah, that's, they were so much better in person. Mm -hmm. Hello, uh, welcome to Jason Kavnis experience. I'm Jason Kavnis. Our guest today is John Krajewski. John, you really be great today. Yeah, definitely. John is CEO and founder of Strange Loop Games, creators of the virtual online world Eco, in which players must join together to build a civilization capable of stopping a meteor without destroying the planet in the process. His mission at Strange Loop is to build the next generation of virtual gaming worlds, which bring us together in a long lasting positive communities. Part of Strange Loop, he worked at EA Sport, EA Electric Eternal Arts in Midway and started his company in 2009. Thanks for being here, John. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So John, first, hopefully an easy question. What do you do for fun? What do I do for fun? Well, uh, gaming is definitely a big part of that, which is not surprising considering my uh, my company. But uh, I love playing uh, board games, especially hosting board games. I just got back from a, a weekend playing Frosthaven, which is the new like giant kind of D&D &D style. So you mean like the old school board game, like Monopoly and Risk and like more like the new kind of Euro styles, okay. like the Settlers of Catan ish, and that whole universe that has spawned in there. I'm really into that and have like hundreds of board games. So, you, have you always been interested in games since the little kid? Oh, know. yeah. Oh, yeah. Since I was like six years old, on the my dad got me Commodore 64, and I was programming a little, uh, little games on that, like, uh, yeah, from the, from the very beginning in basic programming language. So, what about games like intrigues you so much? Yeah, good question. I mean, there's, it's such a big medium. It's hard to, to pin like one particular thing, but I think, I think it's a lot of things. I think it's the idea of these, these worlds, these like separate worlds that have their own kind of physics and rules and like landscape of interaction and you can enter them with other people. So it's like other dimensions you can travel into and they, uh, they inform you about your life. They inform you about reality. Like I've learned a ton from games. I think games are just naturally so educational and like can be super positive in your life when done in the right way. And it's kind of like, I feel like creating a game is kind of like, like you understand a system more if you can create the simulation of it. Like we made, I made a physics engine for our first game vessel. And it was, uh, you know, I had to learn the like, physics equations for uh, liquid physics and fluid dynamics and everything. And like, I had such a great understanding of that by creating this world and becoming part of it. And I think games are kind of like that in every, every aspect. Talk about this a little bit. Like when I was growing up, you know, parents were like, what are you spending too much time in the game? Get outside and play. But now it's like parents need to be, Hey, play the game. You might, you know, make a hundred thousand dollars, you know, cause it's real money being made playing games watching people play games oh I mean, yeah oh, it's yeah. like esport leagues all this kind of stuff right it's uh yeah it's really exploding right now and i think it's just going to keep becoming more and more prominent in culture I mean, if you think about it games have been the number one uh media for a long time in terms of uh like revenue like it's more than movies and music and it's been that way for a long time but it's never really been like the cultural center it's never been like something you like talk to just random people about that much it's kind of, it's more niche and everyone kind of has their like niche of the, what they might play. And I think that's really rapidly changing. And you see it becoming like a thing that celebrities will get on Twitch and like play with their favorite streamer or, you know, uh, it, AOC, the the politician was, was playing among us on Twitch not too long ago. Like it's, it's going from like kind of a basement activity to like a mainstream activity. And I think of it as it's, it's going to become the like center of media and that that's really, you know, that's going to be connected to movies and music and books and everything. Cause this is where you can go. It can be a place. It can be something you interact in. So yeah, those old days of like, you know, get out of your room, stop playing video games. It's definitely come a long way from that. I mean, not to say that there's still not an issue with that. I think it's easy to get sucked into these things and, and forget about the rest of your life. But I think they can connect you that, you know, and done in the right way, games can connect you more to the world rather than being an escape. You remember this? I think it happened a while ago where Snoop Dogg was doing a Twitch, like a live stream of Twitch. Uh -huh. And he left it on. He came back 10 hours later. His, his Twitch live was still on, like hundreds of thousands of people still watching. <laughs> it was like watching this empty room. He came back, you know. That's hilarious. I hadn't heard that, no. Yeah. So one thing I like about gaming and social media in general is the fact, you know, like you meet all these great people, right? And of course, there's other side where you meet like scumbags and, you know, predators, yeah. like how, how can society or you as a company balance this, right? Make sure your, your customers are protected and these scumbags don't like kind of yeah, take advantage yeah. of them. Toxic communities and things yeah, like yeah. that. I mean, it's interesting because it really depends on the type of game too. Like you get a game like COD where, you know, or Rust where you're like trying to 
kill other people or like trick them and take their stuff, it kind of generates just like a toxic kind of culture around it or if you get super competitive experiences where you know somebody doesn't perform you know then you're like toxic towards them or whatever so i think the the type of game can make a big difference to that uh we don't really see a lot of toxicity toxicity in our games just because they're they're much more collaborative they're more cooperative uh you're kind of incentivized to do things that are helpful to other people versus like be a jerk so i think that can be a big part but even still you you need to have like protections you need to make sure that uh you know if kids are playing the game that they're safe and that they're not being you know taken advantage of so it's it's a bit of both i think you tack from the game design side and you you put in protections there is there a minimum age you think where kids would not be allowed to play games like should they start playing at eight nine nine ten years old four years old or do you think it's is sure. That, or is that more like a parental decision? Yeah, it's definitely a parental decision, I think. And I think what matters more is like not if they play games, but what type of games they play. Like if they're playing Grand Theft Auto or Call of Duty at like six years old, that's not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, that's probably not good. Yeah. But if they're playing like Minecraft or they're playing something where they're like building or they're playing with their friends and they're like have a community and they're like learning stuff, that could be a super positive experience. So I think it's it's too lazy to just say like, oh, it's, uh, you know, um, limit screen time to X number of hours. It's like, well, what kind of screen time? There's a huge range in there. Yeah. Um, so I think Mario Brothers has a game coming, I mean, a movie coming out right now. What's a game that you play in the past? You're like, man, I wish they would make a movie of this game. Oh, man. My favorite game of all time is Ultima Online. Okay. Which was like the first, one of the first virtual worlds where it was a, a massively multiplayer game and there was like thousands of people in it. And just crazy experiences that you would have in that, like all kind of like Wild West. Um, so something like that could be interesting. I don't know how you would turn that into a movie because it's not really like a story. It's more like a place and an experience. So, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of like what would be a really compelling one to make into a movie. Yeah, it's kind of hard to do that, like transmedia, because it is so different. Like the games I like are are simulations. They're like settings, they're places, they're they're all about like what happens with the people in those worlds. So turning that into like a traditional narrative can be kind of harder. Okay. But then there's other games like, you know, Last of Us. I just finished watching Last of Us on HBO. I thought they did a really great job on that. It was really close to the game. And that that was a pretty good translation because it's a very like narrative structured game versus like a more simulation structured game. It's a lot harder to do. Is there anything out there that shows like if you play games or or involved in a game where it can be that your like your cognitive dissonance improves or your hands eye ability improves or your math medical ability improves. I've heard oh, yeah. that it does. Oh yeah, totally. And there's all kinds of benefits of all different kinds you can get from games. You know, any kind of activity that you're like being tested at, you're competing at, you kind of naturally are motivated to improve at it. And we've actually done studies on our game. We worked uh, we worked with the University of Illinois. They did research on our game Eco to see like are people's kind of mindsets towards like environmentalism and climate change and like industry, like do they evolve and change as they play the game? And they found that there was a big impact on that kind of thing. So, I mean, yeah, games are, uh, games have a ton of potential for kind of, you know, making you better, not hand-eye coordination, but just like how you think of the world. You know, if you experience this, this world where you're, you know, building a society, the things that you have to do there, the, the ways you have to collaborate with people, that's totally applicable outside the world also. So John, correct me if I'm wrong, but is it like the gaming community like really, really big in Japan and Korea and Asian countries and probably even bigger than it is over here? Yeah, yeah. It's Asian. Uh, the Asian market is massive. Chinese market especially. It's just a really hard one like as a business to try to target because it's uh, everything you went to China has to go through their like censorship pass. So there's a, there's a whole government review of that. So that's it's an extra challenge and you kind of got to localize specifically for those markets. But uh, yeah, it's even even bigger than than the U.S. here, so it's it's not something you want to ignore. I feel like. And Seattle's a pretty big gaming hub itself, right? I know there's a lot of gaming mm -hmm. communities here, a lot of networking things going on. Yeah, yeah, Seattle's got a lot of great companies. I mean, Microsoft with Xbox is here. You got Nintendo here, so like two really big players. I always forget Nintendo's here. Yeah, Nintendo of America is right here in Redmond. Um, and then tons of just, uh, there's a great indie community, Seattle indie community. Yeah. A few year, years ago, we used to have an office with them and it was, uh, yeah, I just met all kinds of really passionate. Isn't there something, a, a thing called Seattle's broadcasters online or something like that? Uh, something like that. I've, I've, I know there's a, there's a few organizations there and they have like events and stuff. So and I'm sure there's quite a few like startups too, right. In the gaming community. Yeah. 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 Startups. And there's bigger ones like Bungie and 
things like that. But uh, yeah, I mean, if you're interested in game development, there's great communities. Yeah, that was like, a good place to be at. Yeah, to get connected to. But do you think that that's because Microsoft is here? Or why, I mean, why Seattle versus the hundreds of thousands of other places that you could have kicked off at? Yeah, it's just got a great like tech kind of vibe to it, right? Like people worked at Microsoft or worked at a, a game company before. I mean, that, that's kind of my story. I actually grew up here in Seattle, but I moved away and came back. So I just decided to start my business here. Um, but yeah, having those kind of feeders of like other studios, our studio, and I used to live in uh, Brisbane, Australia, and we worked at uh, pandemic studios, which eventually was closed. And then all those people, like basically a lot of them became indie developers. So there are all these new seeds and the community got really cool after that. So that's, yeah, it, it really depends like what the environment is of a city for, for fueling that kind of thing. So John, I think most people know what, at least I know what electric arts are game, gaming is, right? Mm -hmm. What is Midway? I don't think I've ever heard of Midway before. <clears throat> Midway is a uh, is an uh, old school game developer. They made Pac-Man. They made uh, a so lot of classics. <laughs> yeah, and they've been around. I don't I don't know if they're still around. I think they may have like closed up. But um, they made Mortal Kombat. You know, they made a lot of the big titles that were really big back then. I I used to work at Midway for. Uh, uh, kind of started my career. Uh, it was surreal software and then it got bought by Midway and we worked on some pretty cool titles, worked on Lord of the Rings title. We worked on this horror game called the suffering. Uh, so yeah, it was a lot of fun working there. So on, on your website, um, you have, uh, I guess your values, players as citizens, wars of seek consequence and user gender society. Can you talk mm -hmm. about why those are important to you? Yeah, sure. So yeah, this is our new website we just put up and I, I put up these articles kind of describing our vision for what we're building and where we want to take it. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I opened it up with this idea of uh, players as citizens, which is a different way of thinking about people who play games. You know, they're not just, you know, you might, a lot of games consider them like a customer. Like they come and they pay and they have an experience. They're like at Disneyland, you know, you buy the ticket, you go, you have the experience and you leave. And he says it's across the world, right? It's not the United States. Yeah. It can be anywhere. Yeah, totally. But I like to think of that. And I think the future that games are going is players more citizens. So they are, they're not just being sold to value. They are the value. So that them being there, them creating this community, uh, the interactions they have with people, you know, content that they create more and more, this world becomes theirs, their owners of this world. And I think that shift from like customers to citizens is really key. And that's what, what we're focusing on for our, our title. And how long did it take for you and your team to come up with this new uh, method of looking at things? Was it overnight or were you just like a long-term process of figuring it out? Yeah. I mean, it's always kind of been there. Like I've always been fascinated with multiplayer experiences and like creating like ego as a, a virtual society. So it's always been created by other players. So really just kind of doubling down on that and taking it, taking it to the next level. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's part of our DNA for sure. Yes. Um, and off topic a little bit, like, I'm sure y'all you, collect a lot of data, right? Like, mm. can like a can a citizen download the data and take it somewhere else? Like, how does that work? Uh, so we're kind of unique that we allow well, we allow people to host to their own worlds. So if you play Eco, you can join someone's world, or you can start your own brand new world. And we actually don't collect any data from those worlds. So, but they have <laughs> they kind of have full control of it. So they can take that uh, world and they can invite whoever they want in it. They can mod the world so they can actually change it. So they're really in control. And I'm, yeah, I'm a big believer in like, you know, letting players have that control, letting them share in the value, be part of that value, rather than trying to like serve them the whole experience. They're an integral part of it. So John, how do you convince people to play your game? Cause you know, there's like all the content out there, all the different games. Yeah. I mean, you know, just staying at home, doing nothing, you know, as a competitor, like, how, <laughs> right. like, you know, there's so much, you know, quote, unquote competition against you. Or how do you convince people to like, spend time on your game? Sure, sure. Uh, I think it's the fact that, it, you know, the unique aspects of our game are, are something you can't really experience anywhere else. This idea of like a virtual society created from scratch where you're like running for office, you're creating an economy, and you're doing this all with real other people. You can get this, this experience that you couldn't really get, I mean, you could read about it in places, but it's only in games that you could like create a currency and create a tax law and like have other people interacting and figuring these things out. And so I think, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of some of the purpose or like the value of behind why you play it. And in terms of convincing people to play the game, um, I think it comes down to a couple factors. One is, 
Uh, Steam is where we sell our game, which is awesome marketplace. They're just continuously like feeding us customers nonstop for years. And uh, to the word of mouth that it's a multiplayer game, you have this world, you want to have play with your friends. So people are kind of naturally incentivized through the game to just like bring their friends in, on board. So that that really helps with uh, bringing new people on. And then three is uh, streamers. So like we do a lot to to really support people who stream eco on Twitch and create these communities that uh, really uh, engage a lot of their audience that then goes and, and plays the game and joins the game too. So really just giving a great experience and making it shareable, making it kind of viral in that aspect as part of the design has been really, really key to letting it take off. So I hate to use the word stereotypical, but who's like your stereotypical game user for your game? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a pretty wide range for us. It's um, like mid-teens, like 14 to like adults, 20, 30, 40. Um, but yeah, there's all, all manner of games players. We kind of think out of like after the Minecraft players age out of Minecraft, here's an experience that's a lot deeper, a lot richer. It has a lot more uh, depth and things you can build, societies you can build. So that's kind of our audience is people who are like, okay, I liked, I liked this Minecraft experience. I want to see where it can go from there. And just that idea of a virtual society can appeal to a lot of different people. And we see it in the way that people play too. Like some people are playing, they just get in there and they'll like do deliveries for like some other person. And some people are getting in there and like setting up a whole constitution and government and really like playing like dozens of hours a day. So is there an age where you, you should be like, dude, like Jason, you're, you're, you're about to be 62 years old or 63 years old, like <laughs> find some better with your life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think games are something you could play forever. Um, yeah, I would never, I would always advise people like, you know, it should be, I think it's, can be a great addition to people's lives. It's just don't get lost in it. You know, don't spend your whole day playing call of duty, swearing to the screen all day. <laughs> right. Like use it in a way that like you interact with the rest of your life. Like if you have kids or your grandkids or family, you can play with them. You can interact with them. It's such a positive experience. And something I really take away from board games as well. And it's a lot of inspiration for, for eco. It's like, how do you create this kind of social landscape where everybody involved is like interacting in new ways you just get to know your friends better you get to know other people better so there's all kinds of positive ways that can add to your life so yeah i wouldn't put an age cap on it yeah i remember i watching somewhere where like this grandson and his grandmother was playing these games in you know, online she, i make this up like she's in like nebraska he's in like you know tennessee uh -huh. and they get together like one hour a day play games right i thought that was so cool yeah we get so many messages from people like oh i play this with my girlfriend and we love it or me and my kids play this or I mean, my grandfather played this. It's it's cool to see it as this like bonding glue between people. Now for streaming, um, I know you have a YouTube channel. Do you also have a Twitch channel? Uh, we do. Yep, Strange Loop Games. Is okay. Our, our Twitch okay. channel okay. is. That, I know when Twitch first came out, it was all game and all kind of stuff. YouTube was kind of behind the game, mm -hmm. so to speak. But that's like YouTube, like really stepping his game on on gaming and Twitch, and like is that. I mean, of course, it has to do with money, of course, right? Mm -hmm. Is there like one platform better than the other one or just depends what you want? Or, or if you're a gaming company, you got to be on both of them regardless. Yeah, we're on we're on both of them. Really, it's Twitch and YouTube are the big ones. It used to be uh, Microsoft had an entry called Mixer, ended up going under. And then Google just canceled their one they had, like a Google something. A Google Stadia? Yeah, didn't they get rid of one? Yeah, that was a little different. That was, uh, that was like cloud gaming. That's something different, okay. Yeah, uh, which is a, sh a shame because it's a really cool tech, but... I think it'll be back in some form or another, yeah. but yeah, Twitch is really the big one. When we, when we stream, we just simulcast to like all of them at once. Yeah. Um, and we do our like Friday dev streams where members of the team will get on and talk about what we're doing. Um, so which one is funner to be on? So I like Twitch is like, to me, it's like Twitch be more fun. Cause like people are more engaged and it seem like you have the subs, all that kind of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. And YouTube is more like, almost like business business. Of course you're business, right? Is there a difference as far as that? Like, do gamers prefer to be on one versus another one? Uh, yeah, I don't know the, really the specifics too much about how they're different. I just know that Twitch is generally the most engaged people. Like, there's there's different levels of fans of our our games, right? There's people who have played like literally thousands of hours. They're going into the dev stream. They know everything that's going on. And then there's people who are just kind of casual, like, oh, I'll check back in every couple of months. Um, so Twitch really engages those like hardcore people. I feel like YouTube is a little more of the like kind of casual. Yeah. Um, but both are really, you know, important parts of the audience. And so when you do your live streams on, on Twitch or YouTube, 
like how do you select the person who's doing the live stream for you right i'm sure i'm sure they got to be engaging like you know kind of uh -huh. outgoing you know like yeah kind of like you know like almost like a tv announcer right yeah good podcast host like yeah. yourself uh yeah that's definitely a skill set and we have people on the team who are just kind of interested in that or like to do that uh, so we try to find someone who, you know, has been with the company a while. They know the game super well. They can just answer lots of questions. Um, and uh, yeah, just let them engage the community. The community has been really uh, great and positive. So they're like asking lots of good questions, kind of just makes the stream go really smooth. And how long does a live stream usually last? Is it like a set time each Friday for an hour or two hours? Or you, yeah. just tell, the, or you tell the person to keep on going until you get tired? It's usually about an hour. Oh, Fridays okay. we do an hour. Okay. Uh -huh. Don't want to like overload people. But yeah, it's fun because right now we have a big update coming out. So there's lots of new stuff to show. Yeah. So everyone's all excited. So I guess that's a great way to like, you know, give updates, what's going on, new features and stuff. Yeah, totally. And involving the community like that for a community type game like this is super key. And and you might not know this, but like on, on your Friday live streams, you have to know like what percentage of your clientele is actually on the live stream. Like suppose you have 100,000 citizens like how much what percent mm -hmm. is actually on the each friday oh it's super low i mean our our videos are like a couple thousand or so um but people watch it afterwards uh so yeah i think it it's that kind of information like filters out like the most hardcore people are going to watch everything we do yeah. and then they're going to play the game and they might tell people oh i saw on the live stream that the boats are coming and they're going to be adding this and that feature so it is, it's kind of like a little hierarchy or like a river yeah. flows out. Yeah. Well, people don't realize that like live stream, whatever case you be, podcast is evergreen, right? Cause I had people tell me, Hey, I listened to your podcast from, but so was like, that was like a year and a half ago. Right. Yeah. You just never know when someone's going to listen to your stuff. Right. That's the great thing about just creating like content or media. And it's the same with the game itself. Mm -hmm. It's like, we built this huge game. If we stopped developing it tomorrow, it would like still be out there for sale yeah. for like years and years. So yeah, the evergreen, evergreen content is just a great way to like form a business, whether it's podcasting or games. And you also have a discord channel too, right? Yeah. Yeah. We got discord. It's got about 50,000 people in it. So why, I mean, I could be wrong. It's like most gamers and tech people on discord now versus Slack, other things. Mm -hmm. Why did discord like become so popular with the gamers? They were always kind of oriented towards games. I think that was their, their primary audience to begin with. And so they just really, you know, double down on that and let slack be the like work one because you know people don't want to feel like they're going to work when they play a video game but like the way that slack organizes the chat is super useful so having that same structure but like in something that's specifically made for games and doesn't feel like work it's funny because they're almost the exact same product that's just like one has a game vibe one has like a work vibe but the fundamentals is like it's it's irc chat it's just like the old school like channels and you have conversations so they're basically the same, but yeah, it all comes down to that vibe. Yeah. And uh, recently you went to something called the Dice uh, Summit. And, uh, was it Vegas? Yeah, yeah. That was like, like this year, right? Or last yeah, year. yeah. That was just uh, last month. So what, what is that about? Uh, Dice is the uh, it's interactive entertainment uh, convention. So it's a video game convention for uh, just developers and business people in the industry. Uh, I was down there because I'm meeting investors, getting to talk to different uh, financiers, venture capitalists, game funds. We're looking to take uh, you know take the next steps as a company, figure out how we want to fund that, and, and uh, yeah, so great to meet tons of people down there. Um, had a poker tournament down there, which I placed in. I was pretty happy about. Uh, but uh, yeah, in Vegas is always fun. So, are there a lot of like like things like this that dice some like gaming conventions across the United States? Yeah, there's another one, uh, Game Developers Conference just happened last week. I was down there too in San Francisco. So there's a number of them that are like game developer focused like that. But then there's also like game player focus, like PAX here in Seattle. PAX is huge. Uh, and those ones are more for like people who love games, people who play games. And we've demoed there sometimes. It's always really, really cool to see people. So for fundraising, are, are you fundraising now or are you just getting, getting ready to fundraise? Yeah, we're just kind of talking to people. I mean, we're kind of in, like, we've fully grown organically thus far as a business, and we can just continue doing that indefinitely. But I think that the direction I see games going in and the way that they are increasing in scope and just cultural, like, importance, now is the time to, like, double down, make these virtual worlds that become like a centerpiece of culture down the road. So that's, that's the argument that I believe for 
taking investment, you know, you got to sell a part of the company to do that, but you accelerate everything. You're pouring jet fuel on yeah. everything. So we could, we could do it slow or we could do it fast for a cost. And I think that that cost is worth it in this case. So now is, even though we haven't done before, I think now is the time. So it's not like you have a pretty positive outlook about your ability to fundraise. Having said that, what are you hearing from people who are like, you know, Silicon Valley Bank just failed, the economy's in shambles. Yeah. Now is not a good time to frame raise. How you, you oh yeah doing all that stuff? I mean, mind? it's it's tricky because it is definitely economically crappy time to be like asking people for money when they don't even know what their bank account is going to be working in like two weeks. Um, but on the on the other side, like that's when the best companies are built is like during a downturn, you know. And you can get uh, a lot of a lot of companies that raise money like in two thousand twenty one. They raise like sky high valuations. It was so ridiculous. Like, yeah. Like, I mean, I mean, exactly. But you have an idea on a napkin, you get like twenty million dollars at oh, an outrageous, outrageous, and, 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 all, and they've built nothing before, have no track record. It's totally. Like, and all the crypto stuff was just freaking out of control. Um, and those companies that actually are like trying to build something and weren't just like rug pulls or like scams. They're having a hard time now because the valuations have dropped just because the whole economy has dropped. They're probably worth like 40% of what they raised on. And now if they want to raise another fund, all those previous investors got to take a huge markdown. They're not going to be happy about that. So there's kind of good reason to raise in a downturn, you oh, yeah, know, I like agree. Uh, in terms of acquiring talent, it's way better. Like, and back in 2021, all my employees were constantly getting uh, poaching emails. I can't imagine. There, yeah, there's so much demand. And our and our jobs email list was like dry. Nobody's applying for jobs. Everybody's trying to like poach our people from jobs. Now it's total opposite. Like our jobs email address is blowing up and the, the poachers aren't, aren't there anymore. So it really, uh, you know, puts us in a better position. If we want to start hiring talent, they're going to be a lot easier to find. And do all your people work in Seattle or they're across the United States? Uh, they're actually all across the world. Across so the world, okay. yeah, we're in 26 different countries. We got okay. 32 people. I'm actually the only one in Seattle now. We okay. we started in Seattle. We used to have an office here, but then we just went remote. We hired a bunch of uh, other people overseas, people who play eco, who we just met online. And yeah, the team is uh, super passionate about what they do. A lot of them are already players of the game. So, so uh, it works out really well for us. And do you run the company off Seattle time? Uh, we kind of have a variety of time zones. So we have like different groups working at different times. Okay. So we have like the Europe team. We have like the Australia team, uh, South America team. Um, and you just kind of, yeah, have these windows when people are online. Yeah. It does, does make it harder because if like, I have a question for somebody who's in, you know, Eastern Europe or something, I have to wait until they're online, but we get used to running it that way. And we yeah. have our, like, uh, you know, we use discord so we can have asynchronous chat. Which so I'm guessing instead of having a meeting every day with everyone, you like do discord and email, you know, like what's yeah. called asynchronous, something? asynchronous communication. Yeah. yeah. That you were exactly yeah. of that. Yeah, yeah, okay. we use that quite a bit. I mean, we'll still do meetings and we do our all hands meeting once every two weeks where, you know, for some people it's like three in the morning, so yeah. they can't always make it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, so you're coming very remote. Like, of course, remote's a big thing now. It's not going away. But I'm firm believer remote works not for everyone, right? Like if you have to have some kind of discipline. Yeah. What do you do to make sure when you hire someone in Eastern Europe or what it case be that they can actually do remote work? Yeah, it makes it really important in a, in a few different aspects. I mean, one, you want to get somebody who's passionate and self-driven because they're not in an office and an office just kind of has that natural like social pressure to like work because like you're in an environment, you're working, but it, if you're at home and like, you know, you got your kids or your girlfriend or whatever, people, boyfriend, they're like bothering you while you're trying to work. Or I'll just watch one one show of, of Game of Thrones or one show of the Metal yeah. Dorian or, you know, what the case it be. It's very easy to get distracted. So you got to hire specifically for people who have demonstrated that they don't do that. And the way what I always look for is have they made games for fun? Like, are they passionate about it enough that they would like take their free time and make their own like game? So that's that's almost like a requirement is to see that they have that that passion for it. Um. And then the other aspect is just trying to build a, a culture is a lot harder when it's remote um, because you can't hang out and like see each other's face. Like well, I haven't met most of my team and they haven't met each other. So we, we do different things like uh, we play online games together. Uh, we, uh, we have our like little meetings and stuff, but it, it takes kind of extra work to like establish that. One of the funniest one I heard when like when someone finally, finally met, like did like a, did, like, a team offsite, everything together, people were like, whoa, you're 6'4". 
like whoa <laughs> you're five four like whoa yeah. like yeah you look different when you're not on zoom in a little box you know you're this tall <laughs> Yeah, I, I can see that happening. We're actually, I want to plan a, uh, like a, a corporate retreat where we all just fly somewhere, like yeah. go to Europe or something and just like get to know each other for a week, work on the game, think about future plans. So hopefully that's something in the cards this year or next year, maybe. So as far as developers, um, like is a developer developer, like if you're a game developer, your skills person is the same as like being like a Python developer or developer website or does this is a specific skill or specific coding so you need to need to know to be a gaming developer there is a lot of specifics you need to know to be a gaming developer especially you want to know at least one of the two engines like unity and unreal are really the dominant ones um <clears throat> i mean you still want to have <laughs> that uh the general programming experience um but it does help a lot if you have some kind of specialty especially if that's unity or you know, we use Unity, so we pretty much only hire programmers who have experience or can get experience in Unity. Um, but yeah, so there's actually not a lot of crossover with like a general programmer working on a website or something. Like okay. we probably, you know, we wouldn't have a role for that type of person besides building our website. And in your background, you have a software development background yourself, right? Uh-huh, yeah. And uh, you got it from the University of Washington, I think, in 2002, I think. Yep, yep, studying computer science. And so was that was it specialized in gaming or something you learned after you graduated from college? You know, back then, they didn't really have a gaming specialty. I think they introduced it a few years later, but I always knew immediately that I wanted to go into games. So I was making games for fun and and just beelined for a game company as soon as I as soon as I graduated. Now, do you also act as a CTO for your company, or you have another person do the CTO role? Yeah, we just uh, we just promoted somebody to interim CTO. This guy Mike, he's super talented. Um, I I mean, I wrote a lot of the engine myself, so I kind of serve the role also of CTO. But uh, yeah, we really look to to develop our team and get them to be that level where they're, you know, not just doing tasks, but like creating tasks and guiding which direction we go. Yeah, so you're looking for you send if you, what you're looking for. I'm guessing like. You tell someone to do one, two, three, they go ahead and do four, five, six without being told, right? Yeah. I think yeah. that's so hard to find nowadays, unfortunately. Yeah. Can they like have the initiative, fill in the blanks? Like it's really just like how much, how much do they care? Like if they see a problem and they're like, oh, not my problem, I'm just gonna leave it. Or do they like, I'm gonna polish this, I'm gonna make this good, not just so that it fixes one problem I'm doing, but it's a stronger architecture too. So we're always trying to like. We do, I, I review all the code that goes in the game, which is, which I kind of like doing, but it also gives a chance to like, look at tasks and be like, okay, this fixes a problem, but we need to think about the long-term architecture, especially with coding. Like we have a project that we want to be working on for, for years and years. So if we like take shortcuts now, it's just going to slow us down and in the future. Up, wait, so it's like, I think called technical debt, builds up technical debt. Yeah, it's technical either, right? debt. So really that's kind of the thing that I, I've most... I'm most frequently needing to like uh, improve our team on is to being aware of and managing technical debt, creating strong architectures. So that's almost, that's almost like hundred percent of my feedback is like, how can we structure this better? How can we architect this better? So when you look to hire developers, what kind of characteristics are you looking for in them? Definitely passionate. Like they're into games. They're, they play games. They're uh, you know, they have stuff they've made for fun. They have games they've made for fun. Uh, they're really just thoughtful and that they can question their assumptions and like be able to kind of figure out problems, be like a detective in some ways, figure out what, what's causing something. And they have like a creativity to them. They're good with people. I mean, it's, it's a lot of different things, but I think the, the core kind of part of it that drives it is, are they passionate and are they good at learning things? Like, can they, and if they have those two things, they can pick up pretty much anything. So as far as performance of developers, like, do you based on like number of lines of like great code they did or like how, how does the developer get, get based on performance? It's hard. We don't, we don't look at number of lines because that's really easy to like game. So any kind of metric that you define, I, I feel like people just find a way to game it like instantly. So it's, it's kind of a ballpark thing. Like if we, go, we look at the features that people are putting in over time and be like, how much time did this one take? How much time did this one take? So and it's not always obvious. Like there's been times in the past where it's like, oh, I think that this person could have been working a lot harder or they're, you know, they weren't and working that's hard or to do something. They're remote and they're somewhere totally different, right? Yeah. And you can't tell. I mean, we don't want to track anybody. Uh, that would be crappy for everybody. 
Uh, so it's really just kind of a, a gut instinct in a lot of ways of like seeing like, okay, here is how long did this thing take you? How big was this feature? Are you like, you know, working hard on it or are you dragging on it? So you kind of got to stay vigilant and just, just having that as the culture, like if the culture is that everybody's working hard, everybody's delivering good quality content, they're reviewing each other. So other people are going to see, you kind of create this like social landscape where it's better to be uh, performance, you know, just socially. And if that's changes, if like you get someone with bad morale who's underperforming, that can just like <laughs> infect everybody and kill the team. So yeah, keeping that healthy is super important. So what's your process for deciding, you know, Jason's a developer for me, but Jason's not making it right. He's not working out right. What's your process for like letting it, this developer go? You got to let somebody go. Yeah. I mean, it, that's really the worst part of it is having to let somebody go. But I mean, you, you kind of have to, if you, if you want to keep a successful business. So typically we'll, uh, we'll like let them know like, oh, you're worried about your performance for these reasons you know, give them some heads up so that they can make changes. And sometimes that's enough. Or sometimes they're just like, we change what team sub team they're on and things change. So we, we might give them a change, give them a chance, especially if there's someone we've invested in. And if, if things don't improve, then, uh, you know, you just gotta tell them, sorry, sorry, it's not working out. We'll give you severance, pay out your vacation. And they'll, they'll find a better place somewhere else that is like contributing to their advancement. Cause in the long run, I mean, even though it sucks for, for both parties, especially the person getting let go, like they'd probably be better off at a place that there's, they're able to be more performant in that they fit with the team better. So you kind of look at it from the bigger picture and yeah, you know, give them, give them severance so that they're not like on their butt, but uh, yeah, it's, it's ne never fun. What do you find most of the developer from? Like you, have, you go to the same place all again, like job fairs, like development, whatever, like how do you find your developer? So the great thing about, developing our game is it has a, uh, a great community of people who are also developers. So there's people who play the game who are just creating code for the game. And we had uh, our CTO actually, which is the player of the game. Wow, that's we a good that way. Yeah. And we, we share the source code. So he just downloaded the source code and he was fixing like the hardest problems. Another reason to play games. Yeah. And he was like fixing these hardest problems that we were having trouble fixing ourselves. And we're like, Hey dude, did you just want a job here? <laughs> and so we hired him as a programmer and he was incredible. And we promoted him to CTO and like, a year later. So yeah, the game itself has been a great recruitment tool. We also work, uh, we have recruiters that will like place ads for us and kind of find people globally. Um, just because it's, it's a lot easier to hire globally. There's so many super smart people like all over the world. It's really, it's a lot harder to hire locally just because there's so many tech com companies yeah. paying like ridiculous salaries. Yeah, people tell me the time, well, Jason, you're, you're in Seattle, it's easy to find tech talent. You don't understand. Like the, the money at Amazon, Microsoft, totally. or, or or if they're really good, they have their own company they're working on, right? Yeah. Or exactly. they just get all these came from boot, boot camp and they have nowhere near the skills you need. Yeah, yeah. So it's tricky to find locally. I mean, just you just widen the market to globally, and suddenly you have like thousand times more options. So it's worked good for us. So same question with designers: Is the designer for a game the same as the designer or anything else, or is that a different skill set too? Yeah, it's a pretty unique one, and we don't really hire people who are just exclusively designers. We hire people who are programmers who like can design or they're artists who can also design. So they're kind of cross-disciplinary in that. I think if you have just exclusive designers, they need, they need so much support and they need like, you know, they can't get in there and fix a problem themselves. They need someone to like constantly be supporting, which on a big team or a big company you can have, but for a smaller company, it's much better to have kind of that dual nature for them. Um, but yeah, designers are, uh, it's a quality you look for in, uh, in creators. You know, we've got some amazing programmers who are also great designers, some great artists who are also great designers. I do a lot of design myself, so I, I really think it's a, a, one of the most fun, fun parts of the job. Um, but yeah, it's not really an exclusive role for us. So does the name Strange Loop Games mean anything? Is there any special significance to it? Yeah, so Strange Loop is a reference to this. It's a philosophical concept, this idea of this recursive self-referential pattern. So this book book was written about this called uh, Gödel Escher Bach, which is really uh, influential for me. But it's, it's basically this idea of uh, a system, a self-contained system can kind of generate its own meaning. And that idea is connected to consciousness of like, how can you have a bunch of atoms that become conscious? Well, it's this strange loop. It's this like 
it kind of a, a system that builds up that considers itself. It puts itself back into the equation, kind of this Ouroboros. And I just really love that idea as a, a framework for uh, games as well. They're these self-contained worlds. They're, they they're generate meaning. You know, value comes out of these just innately, the same way that you can get like consciousness come out of like a bunch of atoms somehow. Like it's an, it's kind of, it's like the most magical thing in the universe, I think, that you can get consciousness from you know, unconscious matter. And the same thing with games is you can get this meaningful world out of just this this video game system. So yeah, kind of a high-minded uh, concept, but uh, yeah, something that's that's kind of deep embedded in the game ideas we make. Nice. Do you think people get too involved in their games? Oh yeah, definitely. I think it's really easy to get sucked into it. I mean, I remember being a kid getting addicted to games and not wanting to do anything and like getting really upset at uh, <laughs> Street Fighter when I get my butt kicked <laughs> continuously. <laughs> So it's easy to like, yeah, go too far in that stuff. Um, and yeah, like I said, it matters a lot, the type of content that you choose. Like if you're getting, if you're getting sucked into a game, but at the same time, you're like, you know, it's Kerbal Space Program where you're building rockets and you're like doing actual rocket science. Like, oh, maybe that's not so bad if you spend like 10 hours a day, like learning rocket science. You know, it's not a bad thing to get sucked into. So I don't think it's necessarily bad, but there is a lot of cases, like if you're just addicted to wow, or you're neglecting your life, you're not getting an education, you're not like developing social relationships or whatever, that, that can easily become bad. So yeah, it's it's complicated. Have you yourself you yourself made like any like personal long-time friends through gaming? Uh yeah, a lot of my best friends, we play uh, board games. So really board games are kind of that that personal connection for me. Uh, on video games, it's usually people that I've met in real life that I connect with and, and play online together with. Um, I don't know that I've met anybody just randomly through a game. I've actually encountered people in a video game that then years later, I ended up working with them at the same company. I was like, oh, that was you? That was you in Ultima Online? So that was pretty cool. But uh, yeah, I think that I think there's going to be more and more of that, that the, the relationships inside of games are something that can go a lot deeper than they go now. And it's something that we build with our games that you have this really rich identity. You know, it's not just your, how your avatar looks. It's like, what's their history? What have they done in the game? What is their like position, their reputation? They have this whole like identity structure that, that other people can see. So you can get to know people in a lot deeper ways. We're actually releasing a feature in the next couple of months where, uh, if you want, you can turn on your webcam and it will watch your face and animate your avatar in the game to what your expressions are and uh, sync up your lips to what you're saying. So you, so in our game, like you can give an election speech, for example, but now with this feature, you'll be able to like see every expression, see them, how they use their hands. And it's just adds so much like human connection to the game. And I think we're gonna see more and more of that, the more of that human connection as an important part of gameplay. Is there a danger of this? Maybe not a danger, maybe it's just a game like we're like, in, in the game, any kind of game, you're the superstar, right? You're the hero, whatever. Uh -huh. But in real life, you're like uh, basically a loser, right? Like you're, you're nobody, right? And then and, and recently, like putting too much time in your superhero status in the virtual world, the game world, and then your own life is like shambles. Yeah. I think games kind of give you this, this fake sense of accomplishment sometimes. Like, and it's not necessarily fake even. Like maybe you did something that's actually really hard to do in a game, but you get that sense of accomplishment that if you're lacking that in your regular life, that can serve as a, a substitute. And I think that can get taken out of hand that you start to rely on that of like, this is what matters now. This this thing in the game, these achievements that I'm getting in the game, they're the things that make me feel important and make me feel powerful because my real life, I don't have that feeling. That's not a great situation. And I think, you know, game companies can be exploitive of that too. This like, and use that to their like financial advantage. So that, that's, you know, the dark side of games of like some mobile games, they have these kind of toxic patterns where they're like, you know, the same kind of tricks you use to get people to gamble money or getting them to put money into this game so that they like don't let their friends down or they don't lose their farm or whatever they've done. And you can, you can go pretty bad with that. And that, I think that makes a bad name for a lot of, a lot of the games industry. Um, but yeah, on the other hand, you know, games can, can really provide a lot of value too. So it's gotta, it's gotta be something you consider in the content. So a game across the world is a game in English everywhere, or do you have like translate it to the country is in? Yeah, we translate it. We're, we actually crowdfund that. So we have, we use crowdin.com, which allows us, we just put up all the text in the game mm -hmm. 
And then people will volunteer from all over the world. I think Italians and French and Spanish. And, you know, we have a Hebrew translation because somebody spoke <laughs> Hebrew and they want to put it into Aramaic or whatever. So it's really cool that, uh, that they help us do that. And, and uh, yeah, we, we just shipped that with a game. And so you're, you're pretty much like open source, right? Kind of, we say shared source. Shared source, okay. Yeah, like if you buy the game at a certain tier, then we we share it. We're... So, how do you make sure that someone doesn't like maliciously jack up the code or something like that? You right. So, well, they can't submit anything to us in particular. Like we would review everything they submit. So, if they submitted a virus, we would just be like, oh, "We're not going to accept that. That's not going to the code base." So, it has to get past our reviews, and we're okay. pretty selective in what comes through. The danger though with open source is that people would like steal the code, recreate their own game and like ship a, a copy and try to like, you know, take our customer base or whatever. And I don't know, I guess that is kind of a risk, but it, I feel like it's the benefits we get from sharing source outweighs that of that happening. And that if somebody was to do that, it'd be really hard for them to execute at the same level that we're doing it. So I don't, I don't see it as much of a risk, although I know it, it has happened. Like yeah, there was a case where sure Chi- has, yeah. yeah, Chinese company like s- stole uh, yeah. the ARC source code and like made a clone of it. Um, but yeah, but there's just so many benefits from having shared source that we kind of risk it anyway. You know, you get people who are like creating mods for the game or we move in our CTO because he just got into the code base. So I think we're going to keep doing it. So how do you think like, AI and this new, what's called chatbot GPT is going to affect gaming uh-huh. or, or is not going to affect it at all? It's uh, it's already having like a big impact. Everyone's excited about the potential for AI generated content in games where you would just say like, paint me this world and it can like immediately do it to your description or players can, uh, you know, create mods, create code from, from these chat generated systems. So it has a potential to like revolutionize it along with everything. I mean, this... I've followed pretty closely in this whole, all these developments with AI is like every day there's a new huge breakthrough and uh, it's a little bit worrying that like we move too fast and we get ourselves into trouble. Yeah. I know I watched in a podcast a couple of weeks ago and somebody said, you got to imagine like I-, I went from playing pong to today. Right. Yeah. In, in one generation. Right. Oh, yeah. And that's like crazy advancement. Right. Totally. And, are, and, are, and are, are we as a human society ready for that? Right. I don't know if we are. Yeah. Or not. Yeah. And now it's, going even faster i mean it's already been like light speed and now it's that's the whole idea of the singularity is that like eventually advancement goes so fast and man it's never felt like closer to the singularity than since chat gpt came out it's like we can talk to this thing that's almost like this alien intelligence you know it's not human but it talks like a human and but it doesn't have the same like motivations like we don't we relate to it in a way that we think of it like the same way we talk to a person but it's it's core fundamentals and everything about it is like so different and we don't understand that yet. And that could be really dangerous. How, how insane would this be? Like AI gets so advanced to like, Hey humans, um, wormholes exist, right? Just, you can, you can travel to Mars in a second, right? What, what are you doing? Right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, they start inventing things or they start creating stuff that like, we don't even know how it works. I mean, uh, I think that's not far off. Yeah, I guess we blame Sam Altman for the Skynet, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we avoid that fate. I mean, it is good that it's on people's radar, and I see yeah. it being talked about a lot. AI safety is like a big concern, and like Sam Altman, to his credit, is also like worried about that. Yeah, yeah. But I watched the interview. I think it was sixty minutes. It's a pretty good interview. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, there's like so much financial pressure. Like the company that that really creates AI is going to be like a trillion dollar company, right? Yeah. And one thing, like, I think people need to be glad that it's Sam Altman, an American company versus some Russian or Chinese or like yeah. other like dictatorial type country like, doing this, right? Totally. Yeah. Chinese. Yeah. Other com- other countries might have a totally different approach to it. And I think that's probably going to start to happen too, especially as these techniques become more widespread because the techniques that they have are like more or less well-known they just have the ability to apply like massive hardware and like talent to making it but like that could be replicated in lots of places so yeah so my opinion is that most americans have no idea about anything about how advanced it is what it does for you right like what do you think about that for ai specifically anything in tech like like most people don't realize like most don't realize that this phone has more tech in it than the moon landing computers right (laughs) yeah like no no one realizes that right like this is this Less than this got us on the moon, right? We take it for people, granted. People have no clue. It's true. It becomes part of the background, which is kind of like what good tech should do. It's like it doesn't, it doesn't exist for its own sake. It's there to like make your life better. Um, 
but you know, doesn't always necessarily do that either. <laughs> like it, the companies that are creating these have their own motives and now we're making AI, which might have its own motive, even separate from the companies that made it. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting how fast these things spread to the public now. Like I remember being in school and using like ICQ and stuff and like, oh, I wonder if the world's ever going to, if it's ever going to be common. It's like, is, am I going to be able to message like my grandma on ICQ? But like now everyone in my family has like text message. I can talk to anybody. I can do a video call with anybody. Everybody's like used to using this stuff. It's really pervasive now. And I think it's just, it's not going to change. It's just going to keep going. Have you seen this? And I think this is like kind of a little creepy and scary where like, like people are older, right? They're like making like um, stories for the other generation, right? Like uh -huh. I answer all these questions like, hey, grandma, what's your favorite fruit? Or hey, you have a message for so-and-so, right? And so they record it live. So like maybe 30 years from now, their great grandchild can say, Hey, mm -hmm. I want to talk to grandma or granddad Jason. Right. What do you think about this? Right. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And I'm also, I saw this thing recently, somebody input all the like speeches of Steve jobs into chat. GPT. I saw that. And he did yeah. like, 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 no COVID did this COVID did that. And like, yeah. And, and you can tell it's not him, but you yeah. really can't tell it's not him. Yeah. And they like matched his voice and everything. And you could just like talk to it. They like basically kind of resurrected this version of, Steve Jobs, in mm -hmm. a sense, which is crazy. Like, you imagine when it gets better, like, would you be able to distinguish it from the actual Steve Jobs? That and, and this thing, the potential of bad with it, too, right? You know, like, you know, you, somebody may do a picture of you doing something wrong and the blackmail you, right? You know, yeah. like, hey, I'm going to show this to your wife or, or, or your best partner, which should be, or maybe running for a presidential campaign. Right. Hey, you know, what's it called? October Surprise. You're the October Surprise. If you, I, I wasn't, I've never been in Texas. Yeah, well, deep fakes. This version was, you know, I could see that happening in like the next election. I mean, we've had like doctored photos forever, but now oh, yeah. you can do it to a new level that people are. Yeah, and, and some people just believe whatever they see, right? They do yeah. no research, you know, simple. What's called reverse? Doesn't Google have like a reverse image search or something like that? Right. Yeah. Like, of course, most up. people don't know that, right? Yeah. I mean, and, if it's in picture, it must be true. And there's a confirmation bias of like, I knew that guy was yeah, a crooked, yeah. so yeah, you're exactly going right. to believe it. Yeah, that's going to be, uh, I think the result is just like nobody believes anything. Any evidence is like, oh, that could be faked, you know, yeah. which puts us in a weird place where like there's, it becomes a lot harder to identify truth in that respect. So, I don't so know what, 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 what tech out now or what future tech really excites you? Uh, I mean, obviously chat GPT and where the whole AI revolution is going. I feel like I've been kind of waiting for this moment for like forever in terms of like, we have something that has like this ability to converse with it, to like have conversation with it. What's the impact on society going to be? I think it's going to transform everything. Like in five years, as this tech starts becoming, we find it in every different aspect of our life, 10 years from now, the world's going to be like unrecognizable. So we're in for like a, a crazy ass decade. Um, but in the more immediate future, I think just gaming and um, the worlds that are being created there are super interesting and the, the tech that's being done for like new gra graphics and gets incredible like unreal 5 just released a new demo last week and it just looks like real like can't distinguish it practically so that's that's a really exciting way these simulations and what you can do with those but yeah there's, there's so much cool stuff happening it feels like it's all happening at once too john how much does tech event each year how much does tech what? Advance each year. Uh, more and more. It's like accelerating. It's like an accelerating pace. Like the. It's almost like what's it called? Compound interest rate. Yeah. Yeah. It's the thing with like um, exponential processes is they feel linear, but, you know, as time goes on, they just speed up. And I feel like we've kind of like hit the knee of the curve of a certain exponential growth in technology, especially with AI, such that. You know, this AI is not only going to make all these things possible, but it's also going to make it easier to make better AI because you use the tool to produce itself and you use it to produce everything else that supports it. So it's, it's this feedback, like speeding up, speeding up loop. And with these like winner take all kind of um, economics behind it of the first person to really crack it gets the like big trillion dollar prize everyone's incentivized to go really fast and forget about safety because there's this trillion dollar prize if you make it. And that's really a recipe to like have some kind of big disaster. So it is, it is pretty scary. I'm reading this, this good book about it. It's called, uh, uh, what's our problem. It's by the guy, uh, Tim Urban, who did wait, but why, uh, blog. And he talks about how 
you know, that we used to be able to make pretty bad mistakes and come back from it. But as our technology increases more and more, eventually we're going to get to the point where like we make a mistake that we can't come back from. Yeah. And so that we're entering this like new era of human civilization that we have to like adjust our approach. We can't tolerate those mistakes like we used to. So here's a deep question for you. Should we put AI in charge of the, all the nuclear weapons? Oh God, no, <laughs> not anytime soon. <laughs> You know, I love Terminator 2, but <laughs> as a movie, not in reality. So <laughs> let's not do that. Exactly right. And what's out of people don't realize, like, how far we come, even like the last 50 years, right? Because, like, example, um, the first flight was, like, I think 1913, 1914, yeah, something like that. something like that. We're to the moon, like, less than 70 years later, right? And We're on the moon. Yeah. And then, like, you know, the stuff we're doing, events and stuff, right? It's mm -hmm. just insane, right? It's like, we, we've sent, like, um, uh, what's it called? Not... Like that's spacious. Like like we send stuff like the Pluto, Mars, Saturn. We have a mm. other James Webb uh, uh, telescope out there, right? Yeah. We're yeah. discovering like millions of galaxies every day, right? Yeah, it's just moving faster and faster, and I think it's only going to continue that way. And like, imagine like fifty years from now, right? And we're like twenty years from now, or like we're still around. Maybe they've made advancements that death is optional. Yeah. Like you, you know, you cure like every disease, you stop aging, like. That seems within our technological reach. And yeah. that is just going to completely change the nature of existence. Like, right? I'm a firm believer, like, maybe not me, but I think my kids, or at least my grandkids, be like, maybe like, we're just going to take a vacation on the moon to the Mars or whatever. I think that's, that's going to yeah. happen. Yeah. And then I used to watch this show on National Geographic called Year Million. And like, all these like advances, like, way in the future, right? Uh -huh. The episode where, like, you know, where someone got cancer, they would shoot like anti cancer bots in the body, and the bots, little robots, would go in the killer cancer cells, right? Mm -hmm. Stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. Or no, the episode was like where you transfer your consciousness to the clouds, so you never really died, right? You're like always alive in the cloud, you know, just like yes. throw off like crazy stuff. Would right? you Would you do that if you could? I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't think <laughs> I, I don't know. That's a tough one, you know? Like, I totally would. I can't wait know? to be a cyborg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but they didn't have to be defended. Like, if, like, pose, like, you're the only one of your loved ones who did it. Like, would you do it then? If one of my loved ones did it. Like, pose, none of your loved ones did it. Like, John, you're crazy as hell. I'm not doing this crazy shit. You know, <laughs> I'm going to die. Yeah, then you have to do it alone. That, yeah. that would definitely change it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know then. Yeah, this, this is the big questions that we're going to have. They're uh, all being theoretical. Oh, no, yeah. We have to answer them. Yeah, but there's a difference to answer a theoretical question versus a real life question, right? Exactly. Now they're becoming real life. Like, oh, it would kill me. Like, in the military, people say, when I go there, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, whatever. Okay, let me know what you do when you get there, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you get there, it's a whole different mindset, right? It's like yeah. totally different, right? Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting to me is like the questions we're facing now with AI in terms of consciousness and like ethics for like sentient beings and all that. It's stuff that's been, been discussed since like the ancient Greeks, like Aristotle and Plato were like yeah. thinking about these things. And now like, a programmer is implementing these ideas and they have to like make concrete decisions about it. And the scary thing, what does the developer has like no more, no, no moral code, no ethics. Like I'm going to do this to fuck everybody over. Right. You yeah. Know? Like, yeah. And you don't know. Yeah. I mean, some, some actor could take an approach of that way of like, we don't care. We just want to get this out there. We want to make as much money as possible. And like, it costs like having a drink if you want one. I mean, sure. Why not yeah. top it off? Yeah. Um, yeah. Definitely interesting question going on world right now. Right now it's like, and you know all the, all the aliens out there you know some people are like that you know oh yeah the aliens are here now the government doesn't tell us you know there's all these ufo sightings right right it's just like i don't know like I and mean, you think about it if you're the government do you really want people to know those aliens like do you really want them to know us to know those aliens right like most people like shit their pants right they like freak out they would freak out they're, they're start looting shit you know like the aliens are coming you know like mm -hmm. so what do you really tell people i don't know like i don't know yeah, I don't, I don't know how you would handle that. I mean, either case is pretty crazy. Like either there's aliens out there or there's not, and both are just crazy to think. Yeah, about. either one. Like, uh, like you gotta think about it. How? I mean, this stats are long, right? All the worlds. I mean, they learn like new possible Earths all the time. You know. Mm -hmm. And another thing too, like we think, you know, we have to have a, a planet with like, oxygen or water. Like, mm -hmm. you know, there's this stuff that exists with carbon dioxide or other stuff, right? Yeah. So maybe, and maybe they're like, you know some kind of jellyfish or like read mm -hmm. something else, right? Maybe it's a different type of life. I just, there's too many stuff out there. I mean, there has to be something out there. And totally. you know, of course I could be totally wrong. Maybe we are the, all the blessed people and the blessed organizations. Maybe we're you know? the first, it's possible too. But yeah, in terms of like gaming worlds, 
I think that's a, a cool idea to like explore. Like mm-hmm. we can make these different worlds. Like you can have a world that's like a habitat of an alien or like you have to build like terraform mm-hmm. the world. So there's all these kind of new experiences I'm really interested in like creating kind of flowing off from our, uh, our current eco game. Do you have any like new gaming ideas that you're working on? We do. Yeah. We got some that are uh, in stealth mode right now, but uh, hopefully announced within the next year or so. Uh, but you kind of get an idea of them from our, our webpage and our, mm-hmm. like, our vision for, you know, this idea of connected virtual worlds. So this idea that you would have like different worlds that you can move between each one is kind of its own individual game, but you can go from game to game and you can have this kind of experience of being uh, this individual in this wider universe, wider connected universe. So Elon Musk calls you and says, Hey, I got a spot for you on the, on the ship to Mars. <laughs> you going? Not the first one. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same way. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe, maybe the fourth or fifth ship. Yeah. Maybe once they got like a hotel there, <laughs> and like, you know, room service. I'm the same way. Y'all, yeah. y'all, y'all have fun with that. I don't want to be the guinea pig though, but uh, I would be amazing experience to have and probably something that, you know, humanity will get to do. Here's one for you. So humans have been around for, you know, depending on who you look at, you know, like 6,000 years, millions of years, right? But regardless how long you think we've been around, do you think we're getting smarter as a species or you think our challenges at the same level as was back in like, you know, medieval times or the times of Renaissance or even before then? I think our hardware is the same. Like it's our brain is like not much evolved from those eras. So really everything else, all the improvements above that are cultural and environment. And if we can create a culture, like a society that is, uh, you know, tolerant of people and like values education, you can squeeze a lot out of the, that old hardware. So yeah, it's kind of like an old computer running new software and we still have lots of the old bugs from the old hardware. And eventually software is going to pass us, I think, in terms of AI. But, um, you know, maybe we find some way to connect to the AI. That's kind of the whole idea behind the Elon Musk's uh, Neuralink mm-hmm. startup is that AI is going to surpass us unless we like are able to increase our own capacity, mental capacity. So do you think someone from the past, like, you know, like Leonardo da Vinci or like um, Galileo or like someone who's like a, a no, we will we'll call them a genius, right? Do you mm-hmm. think they travel, time travel, came today, they would still be geniuses and they would still, and they like, they would dominate our society like they dominated that society? Mm. Yeah, like if they came as adults or babies? I mean, that's a great question. Um, I said adults. Yes, they said adults. Yeah. I think as adults, they would be so wrapped up in like, there'd be so many new things. There's like so many lifetimes ahead of them of just new technological breakthroughs. Didn't that overwhelm them? It would be hard for them to become like a genius, but maybe if they came over as babies, but I, I imagine that the, the reason that those people are so smart is like partially their natural genetics, but a big part of it is just their, their like experience growing up and, you know, the culture around them, their environment and what they, what they found interesting. So John, I found this on your website. Um, Mm -hmm. Honored to be part of the climate summit this week in the United Nations where we announced our company will be a founding member of the Play for the Planet Alliance. So can you talk about that? And before, a question like, how can a gaming society or gaming um, company be like climate for climate change, right? Right. Yeah. So that was, uh, we went to the climate summit uh, a few years ago and we're part of this Playing for the Planet Alliance, which is games that are... Uh, interested in how to raise awareness and make an impact on preventing climate change. So with eco, our game eco, we simulate uh, a full ecology of these, of these worlds, the plants and animals, the like pollution levels, CO2 in the atmosphere. So you can actually like pollute and destroy this world if you're not careful. So as you're playing this game, you just kind of naturally as like a background effect of the physics of the world have to understand your impact and like, uh, be smart about how that impacts it. So it creates this, this idea in your mind of like, okay, I need to think of this environment. It's not an infinite environment. And I need to like, as I'm developing the society, the, the ecosystem is a big part of that. And that to me, I think is, is a valuable lesson that you can take to reality kind of changes your opinions and like makes you think about things you wouldn't have. 
and even gives you like scientific tools of like, we, we expose all the data so you can kind of see statistics of like, what's the CO2 level versus the pollution level versus like player impact, animal populations. So you're actually doing kind of science inside of the game that then would be useful outside of the game. So that's, that's kind of how we approach it of how a game can make a difference in uh, the idea of environmentalism and the idea of like, you know, not destroying our planet, um, which I think is, is a powerful thing. It's like, Games are such a powerful medium, and that's one way that they can impact things in a positive way is is letting people have that experience, letting them understand that experience inside of it. You know, you're not just telling it to them, they're living it, they're doing it. And that's way more powerful than just like reading about it or watching it. Is it possible to win your game? Or do you just keep on playing forever? Is there a way that somebody actually wins? Yeah, you keep on playing forever. We do have a goal. So there's a meteor that's going to hit the planet. And if, and you start from like a pure wilderness. Uh, but then you have to build a society like brick by brick from scratch with other people, creating an industry, creating an economy. You actually create a government where you like elect leaders among the players and you have laws, you can have taxes. So, and you take it to the space age such that you can build a laser and shoot down the meteor. So that's kind of your, your goal of like, you need to build something. You have this goal of something to do. Uh, that And if you fail, the meteor will actually destroy the world. So there's like consequences, real consequences in this world. Um, <clears throat> but you can keep playing forever. And we want to like have gameplay after that, have like you're building culture, you're creating like towns and countries and making these like permanent communities that then start to connect to other permanent communities around. So for the game itself, how important were you and your team like build like a, like a, a, a morally, ethically, base community so to speak you know it's still like you know i'm afraid i want to be able to eco again where like, everyone's like evil and you know being like jr you and a darth vader you know mm -hmm. we want like an ethically based system how do you work with sure that? i mean we kind of let people make their own decisions so for example you can create a government in the game and you start by defining a constitution which says the powers of like uh this group of people can elect a leader this group of people can set taxes this group of people can set a law and you can make like a single person, a dictator of all that, if you want, I mean, you have to like, it's hard to do because other players are going to like stop you from doing it, but it is a possibility in the game or you can make like a communist world, or you can make like use capitalism, or you could have, we have some servers that have UBI where like, as you play the game, you're like given little payments from the government constantly. So it's really just like a, a laboratory where players try all kinds of different things. Um, and yeah, we don't really see like toxic or like really negative kind of creations. People generally follow the, kind of the goals that, that's given to them of like, you can build this really cool world. We're going to go for that, try to support other people. I mean, you do get conflicts though. And that's something that you kind of want. You need conflict in the game to make it interesting. But our conflict isn't like violent. Like you're never attacking or fighting anybody. It's more <laughs> like, I want to run the government this way. And, and this other person wants to run it this other way. You know, I want to be able to chop in all these trees to like build a village because we need this to do this xyz and this feels like no we're going to kill off these species if we do that we need to preserve this so you get even though everybody has the same ultimate goal of like shooting down the meteor you can get these disagreements you know and you and managing those disagreements figuring out how to manage that is uh kind of the foundation of societies it's like groups versus the individual how does the group make this decision and you create a government, you create regulations, you create a process for making those decisions. And that's actually part of the gameplay too. Have you ever thought about it, like having a game and like, and like giving up like a maybe a political science class or sociology class in college? Let yeah. them do experience like, you know, political science class, this group, your communist group, group your, your atheist, this group, your whatever, uh -huh. something like that. We do, uh, we do have schools that use it for that okay. kind of thing. I'd yeah. Like, I'd like to see that, but that's really interesting. Yeah. It's really cool to see what they do. The kids will play it and, um, you know, college level as well, and they'll kind of see where things go, but it's like they use it as an interesting simulation of a society. But yeah, we have, uh, we got a really great review from this one, one, uh, one guy on VentureBeat. He said that uh, in his game, he created a currency and created an economy around this currency. And he was like, trying to figure out how to price things. And he's like, using like monetary policy and like <laughs> learning all these techniques and he's like i learned all this stuff nobody was teaching me i just i needed it and so i like learned it and that's kind of something you can only have that experience in games the so games as an educational medium is super powerful so yeah there's, there's tons of directions you can go has your game made like any predictions like somebody played part of your game and like oh shit 
that happened in the game like three years ago. It's happening <laughs> real life now. Right, right. Well, hopefully no meteors are going to hit the planet <laughs> anytime soon. Yeah, um, hopefully, hopefully all the nuclear weapons are pointed out and yeah. not in, right? Well, we do see people create societies kind of based on what they're used to. So we have Americans will create societies and they all the American servers, like they hate having taxes. They, they don't put many taxes. European servers love their taxes. They have like huge taxes in these worlds. And then when you get them playing together, then you have the like battles of like, oh, I don't want to be taxed and get, get your government money, hands off my money. And those are, those are kind of the interesting spots there. But uh, yeah, it's interesting seeing what people bring to the table. I don't know that it's, it's predictive as much as it is like reflective and kind of represents their like goals and positions on things. So what made you decide to do this game versus the uh, a thousand other games? You, got, you know, shooting games, kid games. Yeah. What what drew you to this type of game? Sure. Well, we've done a few other games as a studio, but this has been our, our biggest success and the one that we're really expanding. And it has been an idea I had since I was a kid. This is the idea of a virtual society where you are creating a world from scratch and everybody in it is a real person. So all the government is run by real people. All the economy is formed by people who are selling things that they made or that they bought or performing services themselves. And every aspect is a real person. And just that idea of creating that as a simulation has been just a lifelong dream of mine. So that's that's kind of where this the idea like sprouted from, this idea of a virtual society. And then bringing in the different simulations, the ecosystem simulation, plants and animal simulations, add so much more depth and impact to that society. They have this foundation that they're building on. So, yeah, that's that's kind of where it comes from. So, so back to fundraising real fast. So, and you may, and I'm sure you know this, but are most people invest in gaming like in San Francisco, Seattle? Is like there's like a hub of investment for gaming somewhere? San Francisco's got a big big hub okay. um we talked to a few people who were from there but it's really global now okay. we talked to like a company from london a company from like cyprus and uh china's got like crazy amounts of money over there so they're a big one which is another ball of wax because taking chinese money can kind of create some political difficulties mm -hmm. too so you got things to consider there but there's some really great investment partners there also um so yeah there's there's kind of like locuses of it uh san francisco probably being the biggest okay. but there's a number of them so let's go back in time you're you're a lead programmer lead developer at ea uh-huh talk about your thought process of like leaving that company i'm pretty sure they were paying more than minimum wage at the time right you're getting paid pretty yeah. good money yeah and like you know what i'm gonna give this up i want to do my own thing talk about the, the process yeah it's it was a it's a tough decision i mean the way it kind of went i had a hobby project that i was working on in my spare time and I just kept doing that to the point of like, you know what, this could really be something cool. I want to take the leap and like make this happen. And so I kind of saved up for a while and eventually decided oh, I'm going to leave EA and uh, do my own thing. And I invited some uh, partners to join me, some people who I used to work with at EA. And they've been awesome. One of them, Malenko, is uh, you know my co-founder. He's still uh, working. He does all our arts. He's incredible. And, uh, yeah, I just kind of took the plunge. I was like, I'm gonna quit my job or I started off with like a trial. I took a week vacation and just worked as if it was my job to see if I did. And I freaking loved it. So then I like pretty soon after that, just quit my job, lived off of savings, lived off of credit cards and ramen and just bootstrapped it. And it was the kind of thing that I knew like, okay, I'm going to try this. And even, even if it fails, I'm going to be glad that I did it, that it was worth it in that respect. Um, but still, you know, give it my all and, and really try to try to make it happen. And, uh, yeah, we're fortunate that was, uh, we've been in business 14 years now and, uh, yeah, starting to grow the studio a lot. We just bootstrapped that whole time. We took, uh, we got some grant funding, we got some, uh, contract funding. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been a ride. Can you talk about some lessons you learned along the way that you, you wish you could pass on to yourself back then? Yeah, I've learned uh, learned some the hard way. We we did have a failed project. We made a, a mobile game. It's like a drawing game, uh, and I think the main reason it failed was because the avenues we had for it to reach people was through Facebook and uh, Twitter, uh, being able to share with friends. And then like halfway through development, they shut those channels off because there was too much spam going through them. So, kind of the main our main plan for like marketing like disappeared halfway through. But uh, we kept working on it. Uh, so I think the thing that I would send back in time would be like, hey, you know, question your assumptions. 
Like, don't assume that something is necessarily going to be successful. Test it out early. Get it out there early. And so with our next game, with Eco, we got there really early. We got a, like a pre-alpha version we put on our website. People started playing it. They liked it. We did a Kickstarter. So it's been, it's been available in development like the whole time. And we're still kind of only, I would say, like 5% of where I want our full like suite of products to be. Um, but uh, having that constant consumer feedback, you build up an audience, you get awesome feedback from them, and you also are able to get more revenue earlier that then you can use to grow it bigger. So it's just like a feedback loop, like creating those little feedback loops is really key. Can you talk about how you did this or maybe how you didn't do this right? I think a lot of software founders, they're like, you know, product, 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 marketing is way down here. Mm -hmm. Or markets are up here and they have no product at all. Like, how do you like balance those two things to make the account of even kill like product versus marketing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's really depends on what you're building, I think. I think for games, there's there's such a an enthusiastic audience for games. Gamers are like the most passionate people for better, for worse. Like if you do something that pisses them off, they will not be shy and like <laughs> review bombing you and like totally like hating on you. Um, so yeah, I think make something early that you can get out there and get feedback on and kind of plan that. So like, if you have a project that needs like a hundred million in development before you can like have people <laughs> try it and a lot of companies do this, that to me is like a totally unnecessary gamble. Cause you could spend like a million and make a pretty cool, like little MVP and like, see how that goes. And like, remember that company from last year, I think it's called Quibi. They're like half a billion dollar oh, yeah. raise and they fell like six weeks. Oh my God. That was crazy. Every ad I saw was Quibi for like a month. I know, right? <laughs> they had some big, like they, Anna Kendrick Con, they had some pretty big stars on their platform. Too, yeah. Right? Yeah. And man, they just fell six flat. Weeks later, like, they did not validate their idea. Nobody wanted that. And yeah, that's, that's definitely a, a lesson learned. I think investors can get into that hype of like, oh, this is going to be the next big thing. It's validated because investor XYZ invested in it, so I'm getting into it. And then you just yeah. like the money piles on and, and piles on. And then you could be like, hey, and a Kendrick's on here, this person on here, mm -hmm. Chance the Rapper's on here, you know. Yeah, we, sounds we, good. We, we can't fail. What was I say? Whenever you say you can't fail, you usually fail. It's totally, yeah. So question your assumptions and don't assume that something is going to like work automatically and like, yeah, face reality, test test things out with players and, and just get it out there early and like follow your passion. I think the we we chose a project that, you know, I had a lot of passion for, but a lot of people on my team, they like weren't into mobile. So for them, it's like they'll they'll do it because you know they support the company and but it, it wasn't their like favorite project. Whereas eco, like everybody's really passionate about it. It it aligns with everybody's interests. That's really key because then you get invested people. Is there a game out there that that, that is not in your in your ecosystem, right? That really excites you that someone else is building uh yeah there's there's so many of them i mean uh what am i looking forward to i really like following the giant projects like star citizen um which has been in development so long have you heard about this game no i haven't so they've raised like 300 million in crowdfunding by oh, wow. like selling spaceships for a game that will exist someday <laughs> oh, what <laughs> yeah that's insane. So there's an incredible amount of money going to, and they release stuff. They just released a patch where like you can go in and kind of experience it. They're kind of doing what I'm talking about where they're doing it early and like developing it as they go. And they've been hyper successful in it. And their vision is just so large for what it is, whether or not they're going to achieve that. I don't know. I, they could have a lot of angry people on the hook who have their like hundred thousand dollar spaceship. And they're like, this is not what I wanted. So it's hard to imagine that not hitting some kind of wall and like, but the vision they have is is awesome. So I, I love that. I just think that there's kind of safer ways to go about it. Um, yeah. Here's one for you. So you do your live streams every Friday. And like people might not know this. Those are like a lot of people with tricks, like, like really big followers, right? Like trick superstars. They have like like millions of followers, right? On the games, whatever. Yeah. Like I guess they're called trick influencers, right? I, I don't know what they're called. It was mm -hmm. like a trick influencer that you're like, man, I wish I could have this person do my live stream for me. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's interesting with the Twitch streamers. They just kind of organically discover us and start streaming. We had a really great experience where there's like a group of streamers called the Late Shifts, and they all streamed Eco at the same time in the same world. And so you could see the society being created from all kinds of different angles. It was really freaking cool. They actually do this every year. And it just brought so much attention to the game. We had like our our sales went through the roof when that happened. So they, they've they been fantastic. And we, you know, we really like to support them as they keep working on it. Um, 
but yeah, I'd like to get in the hands of like the some of the like really big uh big players like the yeah, I don't know. I don't know like my team knows all these Twitch <laughs> personalities, but uh it'd be great to see what happens when, once it goes there. I'd love to get it into the hands of like non-gamers too, like the way AOC played this uh played among us, like having celebrities or having other people get involved in it would be really cool. Yeah. So John, how do you like um recruit you? I think I asked this before. But but for developers, like what what's your process for that? Like, like do you like whiteboard tests? Like what do they have to sure. do? Sure. The way we do it, we contact them, go over their like re uh, resume. We require a portfolio, so we'll usually like look at what games they've done, and then we give them a programming test where we say, hey, here's what you need to make. You have this long to do it. Record yourself doing it, and then send us the final result. And we'll have them create like a little mini puzzle game of with like specific rules. Uh, and, and that works pretty well because then you can just get in and play their game and see like, you know, some people just did the bare minimum. Some people put polish on it. They made it look cool. Some people did polish but didn't get the bare minimum. And those are the ones that's <laughs> so like, okay, they didn't do the basics and they, they put the polish on. Okay, that's probably not a good hire. But you can tell a lot about how they approach building like a little finished product, you know, so they're not just solving like a, I think whiteboard coding is not a good way to measure stuff because like, one, you're writing on a whiteboard, you don't have the tools of an IDE to help you like actually code, right? Like autocomplete or whatever else. And two, it's just such a, like a little contained problem. You want a bigger picture that they're like involving all the different aspects of it. So for us creating like a little experience is, is really what we focus on. So let's suppose there's someone out there, you know, they're real junior, they haven't built anything yet. They want to get into gaming, right? Like, man, I want to work for Strange Loop Games. Yeah. How will they like convince you to like, give them a chance? Like, what would they have to do? They're, they're passionate, but they wouldn't have a built anything yet. They're real junior, maybe you know, just learning this stuff. How would they convince yeah. you? Hey, give me a chance. I'll, I'll you know, I'll, like I'll, I'll scrub your floors. I'll wash your <laughs> clothes. Like, just give me some. Let me I would tell them to just get out there, learn how to program, take an online free course. There's so many great courses out there. Find some friends and make a game together, and like you can do that for free you can make an awesome game for like nothing. All you need is your computer. Uh, get online, find people on a forum or whatever, uh, participate in game jams and just start learning it, making lots of stuff, you know, making little projects and like finishing them and then moving on to the next one. And, and don't try to make like your dream MMO is the first thing you do. But like, yeah, building up that portfolio over time, I think that's the best way to get attention. And that gets more, if someone has like a great game they've made for fun, that's more valuable on a resume than like a degree to me because it shows that they have that drive they really love it they get their self they can self-teach for a remote company that's especially important you need somebody who can be self-reliant like that so yeah that, that'd be my advice so john two-part question first part is who are your mentors like who's mentoring you yeah so i have uh i started working with a great advisor todd hooper he's uh he used to work at unity and he's been uh helping us out fundraising. He's been awesome uh, as he just really knows that whole funding landscape, which for us, you know, we've just grown organically far. So that's new to us. So he's been a great mentor. And I'm kind of hoping like with the investors that we get, we'll get some really experienced like games people who can kind of also help mentor the company and help kind of direct us in that. But then I also learn a lot from my team. Like my, uh, my CTO is probably one of the best programmers I've ever worked with. And I just learned a ton of, I had to like review his code and be like, oh, what is this technique? I have, I'm going to go read up on that. So that you can learn a lot from like the people around you, just surrounding yourself with, with great people like that. And second part, to me, the more important part, who are you maturing? Everyone on the team, all the programmers, especially because I review every code, I give feedback, I give advice. I like say, hey, check out this technique. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, you can see it in their code. Like they, they work here a year and it just, everything just gets so much better. So it's really cool to see people develop that way. And you want people who are like eager to develop and like learn, uh, cause not everybody is. Some people think they know everything right off the bat and they won't listen to the feedback. And that's usually a big problem. Um, but yeah. And then other, other people just in the game industry or wanting to break into it. I'll just meet people at an event or something and try to help them out or other people looking to start companies. I really love entrepreneurship and just, you know, creating something, being a creator, even if it's not games, it's just like something that you're passionate about making that your life is so good for you. It's so good for the world. It, it creates like so much freedom and optionality for you. Cool. Hey, so right now I'm going to play this. Um, you said the ELC 
trailer, right? Yeah, yeah. You just uh, that's our official trailer there. I could talk through it too yeah. if you want. Uh, just click the bottom left there. This one. Yeah. Want me to silent that so you can talk through it, or? Uh, yeah, I can talk through. You you make it full screen if people are watching the video yeah. too. So yeah, so this is what Eco looks like. So it's a a virtual uh, world ecosystem. All the plants and animals are simulated. Uh, we run like simulations for all that. And looming above is this meteor. So this meteor is circling the planet and it's gonna hit the planet in 30 days. So you start the game, you have 30 days, 30 real life days to solve the situation. And you start from a blank wilderness where you're building your cabin, you're chopping down trees, you're taking resources from the environments, you're building up a village, uh, you're making a community, you're gaining in your skills, eat, you know, eating the right foods, building a uh, shelter, and uh, you collaborate and you advance. So you do research, you advance technology, and you can see it advances over time. And uh, eventually your progress starts to impact your natural surroundings more and more. So you begin to have an impact, much more of an impact on the, the environment around you. Uh, so all the different types of resources you can get, you can be mining, you can be uh, farming. Uh, all of these are necessary and everybody kind of has their niche of what they do. And that's where the, the economy comes in is you can, you can be the baker and then you can sell it at your store and trade it to somebody. Or you can be the person who's like transporting stuff. So there's all these different roles and you find your role in there. You'd be a researcher and contribute to the larger whole. And the tech continues to advance. You start to get closer and closer to the modern age and you start to see the uh, impact you have. So, you know, as you're, you're uh, mining oil, you're like chopping down forests, you're harvesting these resources at a large scale that a modern economy needs, you start to affect the environment. And at that point, you need to be uh, understanding the impact you're having and, and do something about it. So here you can see all the different ways of uh, the, the world is simulated, all these different uh, like heat maps showing what's happening. Uh, you create laws, you create a government. So you can see here a law being created, setting a different tax amount for people. Uh, you can designate different regions of things. So you're making these decisions as a group in order to kind of preserve your common resources with your goal of present, preventing this catastrophe without causing one of your own. So you want to stop this meteor, but not destroy the world in the process. And uh, yeah, that's, that's a little quick look at eco. That's, that's, that's insane. Like, quick question for you, like, how, how much of the decision is like, like how much time is spent to decide, like, I want to plant a pecan tree versus an oak tree, you know, like those small, uh -huh. my new decision, like, or just like, we're going to put a tree, I don't care what tree it is. Yeah, I mean, it, it can matter because there's like a wider economy, like maybe pecan wood is way more valuable than like oak wood or whatever. So there's like a, a reason for it. Um, <clears throat> But just one thing that's interesting about this game is that there's more than just the goal you're going for. Like there, it's also a place and it's a community. Like you can be in there and just interacting with people, just hanging out and like getting to know each other or like doing funny things in the world or making your house pretty or whatever, things that aren't necessarily a step towards the goal, but are still like important in the wider context of it's a community, it's a connective thing. So even the little things can have a, a, a big role there. So John, you, you, you talked about this some already, but can you go into more detail, like how the company got started, where you're focused right now and what you see the future of your company being? Sure. So yeah, company got started. I left EA in 2009 and uh, started it. I moved back from Australia. I was, used to live over there and started it here in Seattle. And uh, yeah, we've done uh, six games since then. We did kind of our first game. We bootstrapped it. It's a game called Vessel. Uh, which did well and uh, kind of gave us some opportunity to do some contract work. So we just started kind of like ramping up our projects, doing it over time. Um, but yeah, that first couple of years was really just living off of uh, ramen and credit cards and, and racking up some debt so that when we got our first game, okay, now we can start like paying ourselves and we can pay back some of this debt. So there was a, a big investment and a bit of a gamble to it at front at first, but it was, you know, totally worth it. Um, 
And then we got to Eco, which we, at that point, we'd had a few games under our belt and we were able to get a grant from Department of Education and the National Science Foundation also gave us a grant. And that really let us kind of take it to the extreme of what we want to do. Uh, we were able to get the game uh, created, get it onto Steam and uh, had a great reception there. And it's, we're just continuing to grow it and expand it. Um, so we're about 32 people right now. We just hire online got a great passionate team and yeah now we're thinking about what the next steps are so we have eco that we're is basically our forever game like we're always going to keep adding to it as long as it's uh you know viable and we want to introduce new uh, new worlds that are connected to eco so the specifics of those we haven't announced yet but there's going to be new worlds and these can be modded worlds as well so modding is going to be a big part of it like you can take a world and change the code for it or, or add new things to it, add new systems to it. So you can have these really unique kind of experiences that you're traveling between these worlds. So kind of taking this like the eco experience was kind of a contained experience and, and allowing that to become this like wider universe of all types of different experiences. Players are contributing value to it. You know, they're able to like make money from it as well. Like if they make something really cool, they can earn money from it. And uh, yeah, that's things we're, we're looking to build now that we're, we're taking to the next, next step. It was a crazy idea. Now you have the meteor like in the coming to the planet Earth. Yeah. What if that meteor was launched by like a, another planet to mm, attack Earth, right? Right, right. So you have to go like, like find them. That was the Starship Troopers plot, I think. Was it? Uh, yeah, the bugs were like shooting. Oh, yeah. Well, flinging yeah. the meteors. Yeah, I, the... Thought, I thought I had an original idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then they had to go kill the bugs. That was the reason they had to go kill the bugs. Yeah. yeah, something like that could be interesting. I mean, I love the idea of like modded stuff so that you can make like, you know, we probably won't make a zombie game, but somebody could make a zombie mod for Eco and like make a really cool zombie experience in there. So yeah, I'll, the sky's the limit for that kind of stuff. And, and how long did you live in Australia? Uh, I was there for four years. I lived in Brisbane. I was working at Pandemic Studios, which got bought by EA. So uh, yeah, I worked at EA for a while. And what, and what years were you there? 2009 or uh, 2005 to 2009. And you might not remember, like, how's the tech startup scene there? That was a pretty big one there, too. Uh, not as big as here when I was there. Um, I was in Brisbane, which had actually had a pretty decent gaming like world. There's like a few game companies there. I think it was kind of like the cheap offshore gaming hubs of like big companies. Um, but uh, I mean, I think they're growing a lot now. But yeah, it's uh, it's changed a lot since I've been there too. My partner's still over there. My business partner. Okay. Malenko, he lives in in Brisbane, so he's holding down the fort over there. I need to go back and visit. Yeah, I'm sure you had a lot of fun during the four years. Yeah, it's a beautiful country. I, have you ever been there? No, I haven't. Yeah, it's got a great like wilderness, great culture. It's very laid back. Is it like a hundred thousand hour flight though? Like something? Like, yeah, it's a long like. flight. I <laughs> I don't like doing flights that long, but yeah, it's like sixteen hours or something to get there. But I don't know. It's beautiful once you get there. Yeah. So John, you, you lift weights? I do, yeah. I work out. Okay. What's your like you do, do a bunch of best press? Oh uh, uh, yeah, a bit of everything. Go to it's like a program that I do. do. Okay. So like different and changes up every three months. I'll like switch it out. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so is that how, pretty much how you take care of your health, the weightlifting thing? Yeah. I, I mean, for me, it's like it's kind of a, a life methodology for me. Is like building habits. So working out going to the gym i've just like installed it as like this process in my life it's like a habit that i do without even thinking about it i do it three days a week and i just i just go and i listen to a podcast when i do it and yeah so the fact that i'm listening to a podcast is like okay so it's not like i'm still kind of activating my mind during that time i'm like learning stuff while i'm like physically doing stuff as well and once you install those processes and they become just background things that happen automatically you just stack them, right? Like, so then you have like other processes of like eating healthy or doing this. And it just, once it becomes automatic, you don't have to think about it anymore. It's continually adding value to you. It's that compound interest thing. So Do you have a bad habit right now that you want to try to get rid of. I'm addicted to do dominion, this card game online. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's bad. I'm like, anytime I'm like programming and I'll like hit a hard problem, like, oh, okay, just one game of dominion. Let's do this. So yeah, it, it, it could be worse in terms of bad habits, but uh the other one is like staying up late. That's that's always been a challenge. I'm just not a morning person. So like my lifelong quest of like becoming a morning person is still like raging on. So how do you make sure you keep yourself motivated and challenged every day? 
Yeah. I mean, I think I just, I really love what we're building. So I'm just naturally kind of motivated and, and having that like future idea for it of like, okay, we're here and I want to get here. This is where I want to build. And every day is another step towards that future, like figuring that out. And that's really exciting. So that's really motivating. Uh, having a great team that's doing awesome stuff motivates me. Like a lot of people work during my evening because we're international. So I'll get up in the morning and there's like all this awesome new stuff in the game. It's like, oh, wow, look, they just made this new like camera feature. You can take pictures of stuff in the game and it looks awesome. And it all happened like while I was asleep. And so that's like super motivating of like, hey, I want to like use that. I want to do that. Uh, and in terms of like just keeping myself challenged, that's the great thing about having a team is you kind of, we have people at various parts of their career, you know, from like new newbies who are just straight out of college or even still in college to people who are like really experienced. And so I'll kind of, I always try to work on the hardest stuff because I'm one of them. So, so how do you decide where the hardest stuff is? Uh, it's the unknown stuff. It's like, are you making something that hasn't existed in a game before? Like right now, the feature I'm focusing on is building towns and countries for eco, where you can form people together into a town. Those towns can form into a country. How does that work? I don't, I haven't really seen that in a game. So we're like inventing this from scratch. So that, that to me is like, whatever, I don't know how it's going to work. That's kind of what I, what I gravitate towards. And then once I get it to a point where it's like, okay, I can understand the remaining steps on this task. And I can describe them really well. Now I can get my team to like help me kind of fill in those details. So it allows me to be like the infrastructure guy where I'll like lay out the, you know, the scaffolding and then the team can come in and like help, help make the details. Have you heard this term called, um, I'm going to work till I'm 10 toes up? No, so, I so say, say again. So it's, it's, it's a, a saying say, I'm going to work till I'm 10 toes up, meaning like you're going to work until the day you die, right? Uh so do you see yourself doing that? Or are you going to actually like retire someday and like you take it easy, so to speak? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I don't think I would ever just retire and just do nothing. I would be so bored. I would want to like create something. But I think in the terms of like how I create it, you know, maybe 10 years from now, I'm creating by like telling an AI what I want. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> like it could be work, work could be very different. So I hope to just stay on top of it and you know, kind of ride the waves of change in terms of what it becomes and like keep creating stuff, keep building on stuff and keep supporting others as they do too. So yeah, it'd be great to always be involved in some capacity. Yeah, I think stats prove like when people like, you know, quote unquote retire, yeah, they, they, they die within three or four years, right? Because you have to have a purpose to get up. It doesn't matter what the purpose is. It could be like it could be like going down and going to the coffee shop or whatever case it be, but yeah, you got to have something to do with your life. Totally, yeah, it's just... I don't know. Just laying on a beach all day doesn't sound that appealing. I mean, it's sure for a weekend. Yeah, it's, great. it's fun for a little bit, but then you're like, okay, totally, do, here? totally do something with your your abilities. I mean, that's one of the the great pleasures is like becoming better, doing something, learning, helping others. So with AI, all the potential, do you think that's going to like increase us going to a universal basic income? Uh, you know, I think I think something like that will probably need to happen especially because I think the AI revolution is going to happen really fast and a lot of jobs are going to be lost pretty quickly. Like if self-driving cars become, you know, viable, then like almost overnight, this whole class of jobs of drivers and transport is like becomes obsolete. So what do you do with all those people? Do they now retrain to become influencers or programmers or whatever? Yeah. I watched that on a TV show where like, um, when it was the guy was like, you know, like, or no, pretty soon trucks should be like driverless, right? And so you're just gonna like just like that, 250,000 truckers when the number is like unemployed. Yeah. I mean, our economy can't take it like that, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, how do you like transition that? Yeah, I think there's gonna need to be a lot of societal supports, and I don't think that money enough is gonna solve it. Like, there's just like the dignity of work. Of like, if you work in a job and now you can't do that anymore, even if you're able to pay the bills, like you still need that purpose. You gotta you gotta find that purpose. So I think that's gonna be a big challenge for like society as a whole. Is like how do we redirect from all these old jobs pretty quickly to new jobs? I think over time, like new jobs will be created. New stuff will happen that people will fill into, but there's going to be this immediate shock that we're probably not prepared for. I think people get like this happens all the time, right? Like example I'll use, you know, way back in the day when cars first came out, you know, the horses, right? Those people like went behind the horse and, and, and took the horse shit off the street, right? Yeah. Or they're going to lose their job or people are going to lose their job, right? I think yeah. the same thing today. 
I wish we go back in time to see how they dealt with her, right? Like, how did you like convert yeah, yeah. from like horses, horse shit, the cars? Oh, I think it was really right. funny talking about eco, like back then, like, oh, there's all this horse shit bad for, bad for environment. Let's go to cars, you know? Uh-huh. And then even freaking horse, you know? Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I mean, some jobs is like, you don't really miss them. Like, kind of good that we don't have to be have shit shovelers all in every city <laughs> yeah. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so, you see the pitch back like, oh, right. it's like, in, like, pizza, horse shit everywhere. Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sucks for the person who loses their job, but like societal terms is like, oh, it's better than nobody has to do that. Yeah. Like how, how good a job was that? Like how bad that job suck, right? Yeah. Can you know, back then they probably got like probably paid like 10 cents a day. Yeah. Several pounds and pounds of shit every day. And then you have things like uh, the Luddite movement where they would, uh, when like factories were replacing factory mm-hmm. workers or replacing the like laborers, it, they would uh, like sabotage the machinery. Mm-hmm. But it's like, okay, a factory job or like a labor job kind of sucks anyway. You're just yeah. like doing some repetitive thing all day. Over and over and over again. Yeah, like, but they're like trying to preserve that because that's what they know. But so, yeah, there's that immediate shock. I think we're going to see that yeah. times like 100 oh, yeah. with AI. So hopefully we start making some moves on that and like getting ahead of I it. I mean, there's the robots making pizza and coffee, you know, like uh-huh. like think about it, like those... Um, What's it called? Linemen, like the people like do the like electricity, like you know, there's a hurricane in like Florida, mm-hmm. they go fix the lines. That's pretty dangerous work, right? Yeah. Why not get drones or robots or AI yeah. robots to do that? Right? Totally. But then again, them linemen get paid like hundred thousand dollars a year, right? They make good money, right? Yeah. So all these linemen are suddenly out of good paying jobs. Yeah, yeah. And you want to go be a Takaka influencer or yeah. you know, or like working McDonald's? Yeah, it's, it's a lot of questions that people need to answer. I think. Totally. I mean, it makes makes the whole better but it costs at the individual level that's kind of a theme of what we do in our games too is like you're you're having to make decisions for the benefit of the group which may be costly for individuals or may benefit individuals outsizely and how do you do that that's a really hard problem yeah i think people have trouble like no like the, for the good we need to do this but it's going to cause jason the fucking suck our life of poverty and he's actually gonna suck yeah but all these other people like they're going to be rich blah blah and like we tend to decide, like you know, can like okay, we can't leave Jace behind. Yeah. But based on society, you need to leave Jace behind. Like, yeah, that's yeah. a tough thing to do, I think. Yeah, I don't think I don't think we can do that. I think the stability, like it's going to be a wide enough, spread enough problem that stability of society as a whole would like suffer to the point that you know everybody would be penalized. So yeah. we got to figure out something. So John, is there anything I should have asked you, or anything you want to talk about? I don't have to talk uh, no, about I yet. think you uh, you covered a great uh, great range there. Thanks, Good conversation. Thanks. Um. Can you give us your social media link so people can reach out to you? Yeah, sure. Uh, just Strange Loop Games on Twitter or uh, Jay Krajewski. Um, spelling of that, you probably check the uh, show notes. Yeah, check the show notes. Yeah. <laughs> for my Twitter and uh, LinkedIn, you can just look up my name too. So, John, can you give us any last wisdom, last minute wisdom or advice? Or anything you want to talk about? Last minute wisdom or advice? You know, I would say, uh, like I was talking about the most important thing I look for in candidates is passion. Like if you don't know what your passion is yet, find your passion, make that a priority. Yeah. I'll caveat one thing. I think a lot of people like think, Oh, I'm 21, 22. I don't have my passion. Right. Your mm-hmm. passion, you never know when your passion will come. Right. It might take come your 30, 35, 47, mm-hmm. or maybe that come in when you're 13. Right. Yeah. But you'll know when your passion comes. Be, be open for it. Put yourself in the situations that you can like start to discover what it is. John, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. And to our listeners, thanks for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.